Make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. So we're back with Roy McIntyre for another great clip because the last one did so well and all you guys loved it. But we're here to talk about flying the F4 in AACT. So Roy, can you tell us about that and maybe share a few stories with us? Yeah, good morning and uh, hello to everyone on your crew interview. Um, the Phantom was a very different beast from the Tornado F3. But I should say right up front, I compared to the thousands of hours I had on the F3, I only got... Uh, 350 hours on the Phantom, so I'm by no means an expert here, but I've got some very vivid memories of what it was like to fly the aircraft, um, and particularly in the air combat environment. It was a very different beast. It was an older aircraft, of course, so it didn't have the fly-by-wire system that the Tornado and later aircraft had. Mm. Um, one of the buzz phrases that the uh, hierarchy liked to throw around when the tornado appeared was that it offered the pilot carefree handling. And it did to a certain extent. It was very difficult, not impossible, but very difficult to get into trouble with the uh, tornado. Uh, you could stall it, of course, but to depart it from controlled flight, uh, you really had to be uh, fairly agricultural. Uh, that was not true with the Phantom because it had a very basic flying control system. Uh, indeed, it only really had a what called a stability augmentation system, STABOG, in the three axis, um, three little switches. So it's kind of calmed the aircraft down. Um, when you switch them off, it was like being in a rowing boat out in the open sea. It was all <laughs> a bit rock and rolly and, you know, etc. In fact, I must be honest, whenever... Um, we were flying, pi your pilots to, uh, uh, and navs were up in a twin sticker Phantom uh, and the navigator wanted to fly it from the back. Uh, one of the favourite tricks was just to switch the stab augs off before you handed over control. So the pilot the pilot then has got a smooth aircraft, switches the stab augs off, hands control to the navigator in the back, who's on a sort of bucking bronco. And we would just sit in the front and just tut and say, is that the best you can do? <laughs> and since I have control. And of course, as soon as you take control, you put the stab augs back on and everything is sweetness and light. And we are superheroes. The tricks we used to play on the navigators. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I digress. The Phantom had that basic stability and that was it. What did that mean? It meant if you go towards the boundaries of performance envelope, which you always wanted to do when you were flying the, uh, in combat, you had to be careful. You had to respect it. Otherwise, it would bite you, and it could bite you quite hard. And from that point of view, I actually found flying the Phantom more rewarding and more enjoyable than I did flying the Tornado F3. Why? Because you had to grab it by the scruff of the neck and make it do what you wanted to, it to do. So it was a more satisfying experience. It was harder. Yep, it was more difficult um, to to make it work well, and that was it goes from the circuit to air combat. What we're we talking about here, we're really talking about something called AOA, angle of attack. Now that's not the uh, like the airflow against the wing in the purest sense. It covers a whole number of factors. It was always quite complicated. And although we said it's called angle of attack, AOA. It's not degrees because it's more complex than that. And I never understood it because I'm not into aerodynamics. But it was just, we just measured it in units. Some people called them bananas. It doesn't matter. There were numbers on a gauge, but they are critical to the performance in terms of turning performance of the aircraft. And it just so happens that the Phantom and the Tornado both turned optimally at 19 units, 19 units angle of attack. Whereas the tornado could keep you quite safe at that point, you had to be careful in the Phantom when you're operating up at that level. Now, 
that's where the optimum turn, but of course, the two other factors is your energy levels, and that comes from speed and height. So it, 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 there's various combinations that will come together to produce the best turning performance, the best G you can get at 19 units. Um, what I will say, though, is uh, when I went through 228 OCU as a student pilot, uh, I went up on my mid-course handling check with a QFI in a twin stick Phantom. And the QFI demonstrated something to me. I, I knew all about 21 units. You don't go beyond that because beyond there lives dragons. And it could be, it could be quite nasty. So he put the aircraft into a turn and started pulling. And I watched the units go up and we got to 19 units. And I thought, that's right. That's pretty good. We're turning quite hard here. And he then started pulling more, and he said, just keep watching the AOA, and the gauge went up past 21, 22, 20. Now we're, mm -hmm. I'm thinking this is definitely wrong. At that point, he said, I want you to switch on the fuel dump. Um, now, the fuel dump in the Phantom comes from uh, the trailing edge of the wing quite close to the outer sections where it cants upwards. So there are two dump masts there. So I switched it on, I looked back, and I could see that the fuel was now coming out. But as he pulled harder and harder, the fuel just started to sit on the top surface of the wing and not actually go backwards. We got up to 29 units. Wow. I'm now thinking this aircraft's going to depart now at any stage. But he said, now look at the wing. And what had happened is the fuel is now running up the top surface of the wing and was going over the leading edge. So it's not going backwards, it's running oh, forward. And what had happened is the whole intersection of the wings had stalled. And he's now just flying this very, very carefully. That's the, the problem with the, the Phantom in combat is that you if you take it beyond or up to 21 units or, or sorry, 19 units and beyond, you're now into very dangerous uh, and unpredictable aerodynamic uh, situations. How do you control it? Well, you actually control it with the rudder in those cases. So if you want to try and roll the aircraft, you're using the rudder. So it's a completely different technique from modern aircraft. So you get the aircraft up to 19 units and then your feet come into the operation and that's how you manoeuvre the aircraft around. Um, if you don't do that, you, uh, the aircraft will display something called adverse yaw. Now, what's that all about? Quickly, you've got ailerons on the wing. At high angles of attack, a, a large section of the wing is stalled, as I've just talked about. So an aileron, if you're trying to roll left, you put the stick left, the left aileron comes up to kill lift on that side. The right aileron goes down to increase lift on your right wing to roll you to the left. When you're at high angle of attack in the Phantom, the airlon going up on the left side is stalled. So that has no effect whatsoever. On the right, yes, it's still producing a bit of lift, but it's also producing drag. Mm -hmm. So what then happens or can happen is if you roll or if you put left roll in on the control column, the aircraft yaws to the right because of the increased drag on the right wing. And if you allow that to continue, it could actually depart. So that's the reason why you talk, the Phantom pilots will talk about manoeuvring at high AOA using their feet only, so use the rudder. Mm. Actually, a completely different discipline from later aircraft because it's such a, uh, I'm not saying poor, it's an older design older technology, older concept of aerodynamics, et cetera, et cetera. So that was the beast that you had to deal with um, when, when flying with the Phantom. The other thing to remember is because it was an older aircraft that had an older weapon system, the weapons that first came out, and I'm talking purely about the RAF ones, um, the Sparrow and then the Sky Flash, even the Sky Flash was of a lower standard that, than what eventually ended up on the F3. They started with the AIM-9 Golf Sidewinders, which were rear hemisphere only. Laterally, the AIM-9L, which did have a, high, a head aspect uh, capability. And the radar wasn't as capable. So all in all, you had to work harder flying the aircraft to get into a weapons solution, a shooting opportunity against your opponent. So all in all, it was a lot harder work in combat than the F3 was. 
Now, sure, you didn't have to sweep the wings and all that sort of stuff. You still had a navigator to work with, etc., etc. But no, it was hard work. But it was very satisfying because of that. On the flip side, you have to remember who the opponents were back in the early, late sixties, early seventies when the uh, RAF Phantoms came into uh, service, and you're really talking about the early Megs, possibly nineteen, more likely twenty one, twenty three, twenty seven and some of the um, uh, SUs, um, the fitters, etc., etc. So the, the opposition wasn't that sophisticated. There was no MiG-29s, there was no SU-27s yet. Um, so what we were training against was, a, shall we say, a lower division of opposition, which just changed the, ga- the game a bit, or shall we say it was a different sort of fight than it was... Um, later on because the the F3 was up against stronger opposition all in all it gave the Phantom crews quite rightly through the 70s and 80s um, a feeling of fair superiority in the likely Warsaw Pact opposition that we're going to go against so it was pretty near top of the heap um, Mm -hmm. in those days you just had to work hard to, to get the best out of it um, so in that respect, I, it was it was a very satisfying aircraft to fly in combat, but um, you had to be careful. You had to respect it, and that's why I really enjoyed it. The other big factor in the the British Phantoms um, was the, power, the the engines, the power plant. Now this all came. This is all political again, as ever. Yeah. It's in the aftermath of the TSR2 F111 debacle. Um, Phantom was a very much third choice for the government, and they were trying to do their best to get as much British industry input into the airframe manu- or the jet manufacture. Um, one of the and probably the biggest thing they got was the Rolls Royce Spee engines, most powerful Phantoms ever built. The Royal, the Royal, the British ones, the F4K, F4M, they were also the slowest. So how, how does that work? <laughs> well. The Spey engine in diameter is significantly larger than the G79. So the first thing they had to do, and this all was expensive, but there was political things round about, you know, wrapped up in this. They had to make the back end of the fuselage wider to take the uh, Spey's. The other thing is the Spey's needed a lot more air to operate than the G79s. So at the front end, the air intakes needed to be widened out as well. So if you look at a British Phantom, on plan view compared to a G79 equipped one, you'll see the fuselage has a bit of a sort of hourglass effect because it's got wide fuselage uh, to, with the intakes at the front and then it comes in and then it widens out again at the back where the engines are. Mm-hmm. That caused significant drag, which made them slow uh, slower than G79 Phantoms at lower level and particularly at high level. Mm-hmm. Uh, the recurring theme, British jets running out of puff at height. Um, <laughs> thankfully, Typhoon has stopped that. Um, but anyway, back to the Phantom. But what it did mean is it's, it was a shed load of thrust coming out the back. And in combat, it meant that it could maintain its energy levels longer, give or take, in general terms, or recover energy levels a bit quicker mm-hmm. because of the thrust. Now, I'm not talking about accelerating it per se. I'm talking about getting energy and, and holding on to it. So for that reason, and a big difference, well, a significant difference from the tactics that have developed for the Tornado F3 is that the Phantoms were quite happy to use the vertical uh, in, a, in a visual fight. And there are stories legion from uh, um, Vietnam, from the USAF, about their combat engagements with the MiGs and most of them involve quite significant vertical manoeuvres rather than a flat turning fight. There's the third dimension. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily pure vertical, but they did use the vertical. Um, and so things like rolling scissors and all that sort of stuff were quite commonplace in, in the F4. And, and the fights generally were similar in size in terms of dimensions um, the, to the F3, um, we still needed. We still didn't want the knife fight in the telephone box, but it was generally more vertical inside, so more 3D 
than the uh, Tornado S3 engagements, which tended to be a helter-skelter to Bayside. Mm-hmm. Um, F4s, t- we, we were quite happy to keep things going vertically, and we had the thrust coming out the back, which helped us to min- uh, helped us to maintain doing that for longer. So that was generally how the how the fights looked um, in the visual. But it was um, very very uh, satisfying. But as I keep saying, it was very hard work. Very and my goodness, you did have to respect the aircraft in that in that respect. And before you move on to a couple of stories, Roy, is it? Mm. I've never met a Phantom pilot who disliked flying it. I've met Tornado pilots who dislike it, but Phantom, I've never met one yet. No, uh, and it's for the, from from my personal point of view, it's the reasons I have given you. Is it was so satisfying to fly, um, even in the circuit, as I say, you had to make it do what you wanted to do. There was a lot of throttle movement. You work in the AOE, and it landed because it was designed to land on a carrier. It came down at nineteen units, but it was very slow, so it was very nose up, and mm-hmm. there was no attempt to flare it. It goes into the runway. That it was just like you were going to take the wire on the carrier deck. Mm-hmm. Uh, I likened to it, it landed like a sack of potatoes. It really <laughs> <Very cool>. <laughs> The undercarriage was strong. The brakes weren't worth anything because you don't need brakes on a carrier. Um, so you just thump it down. In fact, with experience, you could put a little bit of a flare on just to take the uh, edge off it. You know, navigators used to rate you with how did they need the gum shield in as you landed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you could make it a little bit softer, but it's nothing to a flaring on that you would have with conventional aircraft. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I, uh, as I say, I was only, only got 350 hours on the Phantom, but uh, what I would say is I likened it, even in the 1980, late 80s when I, when I was on it, I likened it to a car enthusiast who's had a chance to own something like an E-Type Jaguar. Today, against today's supercars, won't hold a candle. Handling, performance, reliability, it's rubbish, but it's a classic. And to be able to say, yep, I've owned an E-Type Jag for a car enthusiast, that's incredible. And I've got the same as a military pilot. I've got 350 hours in my logbook, Phantom, and that means something. That said, when I got the chance to transfer across to the new jet, in those days that was a Tornado S3, I didn't hesitate. I was going because that was the future. Um, And flying satisfaction, pure polling, as we call it, no, it's not the same. It's not as good. And I I would be interested to know what the Typhoon pilots think, those that have flown the F3 going on to the Typhoon, because I think that's gone even further, and I'm guessing the F35 is the same. The flying element has been made so simple by technology um, that perhaps the actual joy of pure flying it isn't there. But there's a very good reason for that. They need the mental capacity to deal with the job. Mm-hmm. So you don't want to be consumed with having to f- concentrate so hard on flying the thing at the expense of being able to fight a battle at, and that's totally totally right but in back in the old days we didn't have that technology um, so the actual aircraft itself was difficult to fly in that respect mm-hmm. but it, it was satisfying because of it, it was great I also thought, although it was nicknamed Double Ugly, I mean the Rhino mm-hmm. I thought it was beautiful I really did. I, I loved looking at the Phantom. And one of the best sights in aviation for me is a Phantom on final approach. It just looks the business. So sorry to see it uh, Sorry to see it, uh, it go. Absolutely, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I'm sure you've got a couple of stories for us there flying the F4, so maybe you could share a yeah. couple with us, Roy. Yeah, well, uh, probably the, the best one. As I say, my, my DACT bit was was virtually nil. I, I did, a, a looking back in my logbook, I knew I, I did a couple of training uh, sorties with, uh, against Hawks, who would be, in those days, sort of simulating the MiG-21 type uh, thing. Mm-hmm. I would be 100 Squadron who were starting to get into the aggressor role, which is, I have to say, just to digress slightly, something that the Air Force has been slow to get a hold of. And I know that... Uh, now you'll probably correct me. Is it nine squadron that now that are dedicated aggressors? It's either or nine it, or twelve, and I can't remember which nine one. Nine or it is. twelve. Yeah. One of them. One of them's 
uh, a Middle East training squadron and the other one's a Gresath. I'll go with nine, and I can probably hear people, our audience, going, no, no you're wrong. No, no. So let's go with that. It's one of no, them no. becoming a, a dedicated uh, aggressor. And that's what 100 were. They're, they're initially in their Canberra days, they were target target facilities flight, and it, a, a, an object in the sky to be shot at training wise um, with the hawk they developed started to develop tactics which is something that the americans have done extremely well um anyway so they would be simulating mig 21s and uh, typically with a phantom pair going against another uh, going against a pair of non bvr type aircraft like mig 21 mm-hmm. so there's no head sector threat so he hasn't got a big sword in right in front of your face so you can kind of muscle in with advantage and and just like anything else when you go into a fight you want to go in with maximum situational awareness but more than anything you want to be following rockets in you want to have launched at range because if you've got missiles going towards your opponent it means he's fighting your missile defending against it and he's not fighting you so it gives you the advantage and if one of them hits before you get to the merge and you see a fireball, brilliant. But you come in with a, um, hopefully following missiles in and you're going to give yourself some turning room because the aircraft, just like the F-3, wasn't an agile fighter, so you need to give yourself turning room. We would go in and I say, with a height split, make it difficult for the uh, opposition to pick up tally on both because the other great thing in, in combat is... You can't fight what you can't see. Mm-hmm. And if you can't see it, it'll probably kill you. So being unsighted on the enemy was a great thing if you could it would give you advantage, whether it's to escape or to press home uh, an attack. Very similar in terms of the F3 when we're actually in the fight itself. Navigators generally taking care of defensive aids, watching height, watching speed, maybe looking out for where your friend is, your friendly aircraft is, while you press in and attack. But it was uh, great fun, very hard work, and a lot of talking. So that was DACT generally in in the Hulk to kind of gloss over it. To a more specific uh, story, which is probably, probably my favourite Phantom story, wasn't air combat per se. Um, it was during my workup uh, on the squadron to become combat ready, called the Convex. The squadron happened to be taking part in a NATO squadron exchange with 311 uh, Royal Netherlands Air Force at uh, Vocal Air Force Base, F-16s. Yeah. I also got an F-16 trip and did my 9G start. However, I digress. Yeah. On this particular sortie, we were going into Germany. There's no low flying in the Netherlands, so you all go, go to, when those days, went to West Germany. Uh, to one of the low flying zones, and the setup was a two v two plus two. What does that mean? Two fighters, of which I was the subordinate element, against two other fighters, which were forty three squadron Phantoms, escorting two Dutch F sixteen who were playing bombers. So they were not going to be shooting back. They were, and they were going to be restricted maneuverability. So our job, and they were coming in at low level. So our job was to go and attack them as best we can. So we set up for the run, and we're running down, and I'm told, my navigator's telling me, right, whatever you do, keep formation with the leader out on my uh, right-hand side, about a mile and a half battle. So we're going down, we're working the radar, and I'm trying to look around this unfamiliar terrain, relatively flat, and then I look across again at my leader, and I pick up, there's an F-16 sitting on it, and instead of shouting on the radio to blacksmith, uh, blacksmith one break right, you know, bogey your sick level, well, whatever. I kind of naively just said to my nav, oh, look, there's an F-16 on dash one. He goes, yes, have a look in your seven o'clock. So I then just turned my head round, and there's an F-16 sitting in fighting wing on me. Both of them come in. I hadn't even seen them. So that's how sharp I was. <laughs> and I look back, and I could see it was a Belgian F-16. Really? Okay. So I said to him, now, he's, he's putting, he's making signs. He said, yeah, he's trying to get us to come to a frequency, but just ignore him, stay in battle. Oh, okay, right. And uh, my nav just sort of gave the usual sign, which was, that means f- the fight is this way. So they're staying with us now. Okay, so it's now a 2 plus 2 v 2 plus 2. I didn't authorise the sortie. I'm just going along. I'll just do what I'm told. 
And he said, don't worry about them, you just keep on doing it. So we came in, we saw them out, we got our head sector shots away, um, the package goes past us, the two Belgian F-16s peel off and they go straight into the fight. We do what was standard tactic with, uh, in those days, was to check down threat. And that was to continue searching beyond the, the, the aircraft we've seen in case there was some more, because there's nothing more deadly than going, ha-ha, there they are, and we cross-turn in till we turn towards each other and then chase down the boys that have just gone past us to start picking up the ones that simulated we haven't shot, and then two miles behind them, there are more who are mm. going to shoot us up the bum. So we we clear down threat, which means that the package moves typically three or four miles down route before we cross-turn in and head back the other way which we duly do. So we now come round and we face up and I'm looking at and I'm expecting to see six aircraft. There should be two Phantoms and now four F-16s doing some sort of furball. And I look forward, there's a whole lot more than that. And I, and I say to my nav, I, I said to Ian, I, look, there's an awful lot of aircraft out. He said, just don't lose contact with the leader. Right, okay. So we go in, and then a phantom comes down past me, and I see 19 squadron markings. Okay, so that's the Wildenrath boys. Then there's a 92 squadron, there's an F 111, there's F 15, <laughs> there's Harriers, there's GR, Tornado GR, and this is just mayhem. I mean, the, R, the RWR is going mental. I don't know how many times I was shot, a lot. <laughs> I know that I trigger press simultaneously on, on a lot of opportunities in front of us. And then just like, as they said in, bat in the Battle of Britain, suddenly, oh, where have they all gone? I'm in clear airspace, looking at the German countryside, and there's my leader. Or at least I managed to stay in, ba in battle with my leader. And they're gone. But that stays the fuel's pretty low, and so we actually recover back, and we get back to Vocal, meet up with the other boys, and we're sort of going, well, what the heck happened there? And then we all came out that we'd, we, what would happen is we had stumbled into the TLP package, Tactical Leadership Program, which in those days was being flown out of Jever in northern Germany, um, and we had hit their package uh, inadvertently and caused a bit, of, <laughs> a bit of mayhem, and we managed in the debrief to uh, account for 22 aircraft. Now, it's been recounted, and I know people in the comments have mentioned this before, but it was in the vicinity of a, a well-known landmark called Piheim Mast, and there have been plenty of battles of Piheim Mast, but that was mine, um, and uh, it was eye-opening, but absolutely brilliant fun. Wow. The postscript to it was that 43 Squadron had a crew on that TLP course, so they were in that fight. <laughs> and in their debrief, they were getting all sorts of plaudits because of saying, bloody hell, every time we turn, you were there. There's a 43 squadron phantom. You were there. <laughs> what the staff didn't realise was there wasn't one 43 squadron phantom in that fight. There was five. <laughs> so that's our sort of odds. So, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. So when you mixed in, uh, you uh, accidentally joined that, um, you know, their exercise. Did they actually join in with you or they were just thinking, oh, yeah. Wait, what's happened? No, oh, no, right, no, they, no, no. they have to react. They oh, have right. to, they would have to react. And it probably spoiled their training objectives a bit because they weren't expect. I'm assuming that the 19 and the 92 squadron fanders were also part of TLP as well. But to have an extra six aircraft randomly thrown in, unbriefed you know in fact it was more than that it was eight aircraft it was two f uh, four phantoms and four f-16s which we had brought to the fight kind of upset the odds a bit um the important thing there is that everybody sticks to the rules of target of opportunity and affiliation and you maintain separation but you've got to keep your eyes open and there's always the danger and the risk of unbriefed elements coming in like that that something you know, untoward or tragic could happen, but we we got away with it, and um, nobody actually got on the phone and went, "What the bloody what's going on there?" Etc. Um, it was just one of those things that happened in those days. Yeah, I wonder. I don't think you could get away with that in uh, no. like now, nowhere. Um, <laughs> the risk levels were there, and accidents did happen. Yeah. And you can be very cavalier about, oh, in the old days, we used to do this, we used to do that. But the accident rate was high and people died. 
So you can't really sit, I can't really sit here and go, oh, well, in the old day, it was much, much better. No, it wasn't. It was enjoyable at the time, but there's no doubt about it, it was more dangerous. Oh, absolutely. And we yeah. have a safer operating, more efficient operating, this sounds like a particle, party political broadcast, and it isn't now, <laughs> it's, it's the truth. The, 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 the Air Force is a safer place. In certain respects, and in certain areas, particularly the area that I was in when I was at the end of my career, I felt that it was over safe and it was killing enjoyment, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm talking about basic training. But it's difficult to argue against safety. You know, as long as it doesn't inhibit your getting your job done, whatever that job is. Yeah, so just before uh, we wrap up this little clip here, um, yeah, because obviously we do the happy hour episodes and hopefully we can get you on for one. But, uh, yeah, so what was it like, I suppose, like back in the day? I'm guessing it was a lot different, you know, the you know happy hours on the Fridays uh, compared to now. Absolutely. absolutely. And look, I, I know there'll be stations up and down the country like this and out in Germany, etc. But my main experience, particularly Phantoms, uh, was Lucas and it was Tribal. It was tribal. It was Rangers and Celtic. There was the treble one end, there was the 43 squadron end, and near the twain shall meet. And <laughs> it did get ugly at times. Uh, I do recall one certain boss being thrown out the window by the other squadron um, out onto the patio and stuff like that. There was all sorts of songs and all the rest of it and, you know, what have you. But it was good. And then eventually everybody's pals at the end of it, usually soaking flying suits, the bar is a complete mess but we just <laughs> you just did it and just let your the tensions of the week go and it, it's how we um how we got along um things changed what changed drink driving and a lot more people lived off base so happy hours got quieter and people didn't drink uh, and they naturally sort of died because of that um again I'm not going to say drink driving's wrong. Uh, well, drink driving is wrong. I'm not saying I'm not saying the laws were wrong. It just we lived in a different time then when we could. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and there was more people on base, so you were drunk in charge of a bicycle trying to get to the married patch and that sort of stuff. <laughs> but they were brilliant. We're brilliant. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and hopefully we can talk about more um, more about that uh, in the happy hour episode when everything's cleared up and yeah. We're all clear to go and we can sit Absolutely. in your, hopefully you get some good <laughs> shots. But uh, before we leave you, Roy, uh, how would you sum up your time on the F4? It was a steep learning curve. Um, I will ha I'm happy to admit that I was almost chopped on the OCU because I was struggling to fly the aircraft to begin with. Um, but my course mentor wrote in my logbook, um, hidden talents will emerge with time. And luckily I had time and got a lot better and really enjoyed it. Um, it was it was on 43 Squadron, which is where I wanted to be. Um, I can't remember if I mentioned before on, on one of the previous ones, if you'd asked me when I was 10 years old, what did I want to be? Not only did I want to be a pilot, I wanted to be on 43 Squadron, and my first tour was as a pilot on 43. So I was living the dream at that stage. And I was sorry it was coming to an end, um, but I had some great adventure. I also experienced... Um, first fatalities um, mm. of people that I knew uh, at close hand. There was guys I knew through training that had, had gone, but this was on a score, and that was a that was a strange happy hour as well when the first time we had lost somebody mm. and the drinking on their bar bill and all that sort of stuff. Um, but got to see some, uh, some really interesting uh, places and detachments, QRA, of course, my first intercept, the Russian. So it really was... A cracking, cracking tour, and as I say, I'm glad that I managed to uh, get the opportunity to fly what is a classic, classic military jet. Absolutely, but uh, yeah, Roy, thanks very much again for joining us. It's been a pleasure, and I'm sure the viewers no. are going to love this uh, story as much as the last um, as the last one. So thanks again, Roy. No bother. I'll see you soon. Cheers. Mm -hmm.